This video contains spoilers for all the media that are listed on screen right now. Um, yeah. The anime film Perfect Blue opens on a live tokusatsu performance. A team of masked red, green, and blue Power Ranger-esque looking tokusatsu superheroes fight off a rather generic looking tokusatsu villain boss. Now, picture yourself in the shoes of an ordinary anime fan during the late 90s. You hear about this weird psycho thriller anime film that's got some favorable attention from film folks around the world. The poster depicts a realistic looking woman in an erotic and dramatized pose, bathed in mysterious harsh blue light or video scan lines. So you go out to your local video store and get yourself a DVD of this super mature looking anime film and get that. Now, Perfect Blue is not a bait film, nor is it really about tokusatsu, but the film begins, like how I described it, for a purpose. A purpose that Satoshi Kon, the director, had clearly thought of while storyboarding. So suppose someone goes and picks it up because it looks a bit scary and sort of realistic. And if this was what he saw when he took the video home and popped it in, he'd think he borrowed the wrong movie. In reality, however, Perfect Blue is a film about a woman in the realm of show business. Mima is an idol, or was an idol. Right after the said Power Ranger scene, the camera pulls back to show that what we were actually watching was simply a performance. There are audiences watching inside the film Perfect Blue, and they are actually talking about another performance that's apparently scheduled to take place right after this tokusatsu show. And this performance is of none other than the idol trio Cham, of which Mima is a part of, or at least was a part of, as during the middle of the performance, she interrupts to announce to her audience that she's actually quitting being an idol and taking up acting instead. The editing that's present during the opening scenes of the film is quite iconic, as the film cuts between the performance and Mima going about her life in a really smooth way. Take for instance the transition where Kohn uses this simple body movement to cut between the two, as if Mima herself is wavering between the two scenes. In fact, when bringing up the editing and shot composition of the movie, you can easily observe that a good majority of the film is made of transitions like this one, and looking into it further, this interplay between performances and reality continues to be a structural motif throughout the film. Mima's personal narrative of learning about a certain fan website of hers called Mima's Room that's being run by someone claiming to be her, who seems to be getting information that's uncomfortably personal, and also the fact that people she works with and is in the vicinity of are being murdered in an incredibly grotesque fashion. All are merged into the story of the psycho thriller film that Mima's actually working on. Her acting performances in the film is sewn into her real life, and later her dreams and slash or hallucinations. Satoshi Kon engages in this uh, pullback technique throughout the film, just like how he did for the Power Rangers opening. Y yeah, that, that, that sounds like something else, but I'm gonna continue using that term because I'm dumb and don't know any French terms that sound fancy. <clears throat> However, this pullback technique, this technique of revealing that what we were actually watching isn't what we thought it was, is an action that, in my opinion, requires a deeper look into. And I think that when this deeper examination is provided, we would be left with a much wider understanding of what Satoshi Kon has to say about the nature of anime, film, and art in general. And what better place is there to continue this analysis than the very next film Satoshi Kon directed five years after Perfect Blue, Millennium Actress. Millennium Actress is a science fiction film that opens at its very end, with the heroine 
climbing into a rocket, determined to fly to her lover as her colleague astronaut confesses his love for her. Um, what's that you say? Ha ha, real funny. You are very smart and intelligent. You have subverted our expectations following the theme of pulling back from a performance. You deserve a million subscribers and hordes of fame and wealth. Did I hear that correctly? Because whoever said that hit it right on the money. Is Millennium Actress actually opens with a performance, or more specifically, a film? that the actress Chiyoko Fujiwara acted in and is being watched by Genya, the interviewer who is a fan of hers and is going to interview her. In fact, this film, just like Perfect Blue, is an amalgamation of Fujiwara's life, her work, and other stuff. Like Perfect Blue, it is quite difficult to make out where reality ends and performance begins. Chiyoko's journey as an actress begins in Manchuria, where she agrees to travel to with a secret motive of looking for a fugitive she helped hide for a day whom she had fallen in love with. Certain scenes they film for their movie with its context stripped fit the story's context perfectly. For example, she meets her co-actress who's more experienced and is dismissive of her. However, in one scene, their dialogue inside the film they are shooting blends into the dialogue that is being said outside the movie. But of course, inside the film, Millennium Actress. The entirety of the film jumps from movie to movie, period to period, and genre to genre following the actress's legacy while keeping a general narrative of her chasing after this mysterious painter. And just like Perfect Blue, the film does so in an intentionally disorientating way. At certain points, the characters of the previous movie continue to act with the knowledge of that previous movie in mind. At others, Cone cuts seamlessly between periods and between films and also the real interview that makes up the meat of the plot. And just like Perfect Blue, all of the editing crescendos at the a few minutes over an hour mark, where the main characters wander about in their broken sense of time and reality. This pullback method is put right on stage to be admired from all sides here. However, where they really deviate from each other is in the end. Without spoiling much, let's say, in the end of Perfect Blue, there is an ultimate pullback that happens that leads to a chase scene that acts as the climax of the story. After the climax, the epilogue shows… hmm… well, you see, the ending is left rather ambiguous. The last line of the film is Mima saying with a smile of conviction on her face after looking at the rearview mirror of her car. I'm real. This scene follows a couple of other scenes that vaguely encourages us to question if the Mima who says the ending line inside her car is actually Mima. A couple of background characters mutter to themselves that the person looks like this actress, but oh, she's probably just a look-alike, nudging us to question the fact ourselves. But the ending of Millennium Actress is much more straightforward in that its ending is quite sure of whether it is real or not. It ends with instead of the real Chiyoko, the unreal astronaut character that Chiyoko once played for a movie, determined to chase after her love to the ends of the universe in her space rocket. In Perfect Blue, the pullback is used to confuse and disorientate the audience and leave them with an ambiguous ending that creates a disturbing layer over the whole picture the film paints. Whereas in Millennium Actress, the same technique is used, less to disturb, but to paint a picture of grandness to Chiyoko's life. These two films, five years apart, can be interpreted as a dialogue that Satoshi Kon constructed amongst themselves. One covered in the cynical, cold, neo-noir color schemes, 
leading us through a fever dream where its main characters and by extension our entire grasp of reality is challenged and left estranged at the end. The other, cheerful and eccentric, covered in vibrant colors, hops through the main character's life with exuberance, leading us through the bizarre nature of romance and the act of creation. Perfect Blue's echoes can be heard in Millennium Actress. Perfect Blue's stalker, the so-called me maniac can be vaguely seen in Genya himself, with both the films opening with their main characters being objects to these characters' voyeuristic gaze, both Genya and me maniac being depicted as a sort of enigmatic constant in a sea of variables as both of them go in and out of the main characters' lives and their hallucinations slash dreams. Okay, you must say. So Perfect Blue is Satoshi Kon criticizing escapism whereas Millennium Actress is him embracing it. So what of it? If you do say that, you are yet again right, my friend. As this is, to some extent, part of what's happening. Perfect Blue's Mima becomes alienated from her own identity because of the performances she produces. That is, her work as an idol. And later, her acting career further acts as a catalyst to her losing her grip on reality. The further she lets herself fall into the shooting of the film, the more her personhood she loses, shown by how she's willing to do incredibly uncomfortable scenes even if she doesn't want to. The more she's alienated from herself, the less the films make sense. And the pullback technique here aids this disorientation. Now look at Millennium Actress's Chiyoko. Her acting career, that is her art or her performances, becomes a catalyst for her finding herself. In the disorientating scenes of this film, Chiyoko, unlike Mima, is confident and self-assured. The more the film becomes a fusion of different movies, dreams, and her own life, the more Chiyoko's personhood is solidified. Hence, as a total opposite to Mima, Chiyoko is the bright side of performances and art. Through her art, Chiyoko is able to self-actualize and deal with her desires in a positive way. Here, the pullback technique is used to support Chiyoko, to uplift her indulgence in escapism rather than to criticize it like in Perfect Blue. You are right in all this. However, as you may recall, only partly right. To illustrate the other part, we need to move the spotlight over to a another director who's also well known for making weird surreal movies that aren't afraid to play with their coherence. That of course being the one and only cow man. Cow? Is that a fucking cow on the street? <laughs> Some kind of cow. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Dude, check it out. It's David Lynch. Oh my god, is that fucking <laughs> David fuck? Lynch? David Lynch, or more specifically, his film, Inland Empire. What is Inland Empire? Well, there are a couple of ways to answer that question, but as an introductory one, let's say Inland Empire is a film about an actress named Nikki. She gets a new major acting role for a romance film as the main heroine, starring besides the main male lead, played by an actor named Devon. But you see, Nikki has a very jealous and controlling husband who threatens Devon to not ever fool around with Nikki. And as the filming process goes on, that exact thing happens. That's how most synopses you could find about the film will describe it. However, going into this almost three hour long film with an expectation of seeing a romance drama would be like going into Melania's boss fight expecting her to be a harmless NPC. Inland Empire is a three hour long film about films. You see, Inland Empire does not hide its true intentions from the very beginning. It opens in black and white on a seeming prostitute and her employer as they enter their hotel room, their faces blurred digitally. After a very uncomfortable few minutes, the camera cuts to who I think 
is the same woman, now on her bed watching TV. She cries as she watches a program of anthropomorphic rabbits in a sitcom-like set, talking incoherently. I am going to find out one day. When will you tell it? Who could have known? We cut back to these rabbits all through the film, and never do they really ever make much sense. The main plot, as I described earlier, kicks in later, as we get to know Nikki. We learn that On High in Blue Tomorrows, the film they are working on, is not exactly an original film, but a sort of a remake, as the past attempt at making the film ended up in the main leads being murdered. We are also told that Nikki's husband is a rather shady dude, and his threats to Devon do not help refute that fact. As the filming process goes on, Nikki and Devon's relationship seems to get more intimate, but also not exactly, as Nikki, the actress, begins to slowly blend into the character of Susan, and the third act is a completely incomprehensible surreal nightmare where God, God damn it! I can't really tell you what exactly happens there, because I, I, I don't know. The entirety of Inland Empire feels uncomfortable and odd. At times, the camera pulls right up close into the characters' faces, distorting them and making them look almost cartoonish. At certain moments, the camera moves with a jarring pace and handheld shakes litters the sequences, and at others, it sits strangely still. The editing, too, feels otherworldly, especially during the latter portion of the film where the uncanny disorientation hits a prideful peak. Even before the end, we are shown these little scenes that really make you feel confused and disturbed out of your head. There is a scene where a group of women that we don't know and also don't really exist begin to do a dance number before completely disappearing in a split second. There is another where Nikki says, Where am I? I'm And the women she's talking to begin to laugh, and she begins to laugh along with them. And then there is this. I just had to let you experience that whole scene. It's seriously one of my favorite scenes of all time. Like, jeez, dude. Anyways, if you think I'm doing the film injustice by ripping them out of their context, then yeah, I am ripping them out of their context. But I dare you to watch the whole film and explain them to me with that said context. I assure you, it'll make little to no difference at all. David Lynch is a man who is quite notorious for his surrealism. If you've been around film circles a lot, you've probably heard of the quintessential surrealist film, Eraserhead, which has a scene where a woman with a deformity stomps on fetuses that I honestly will never get out of my head. Lynch started out as a painter, and looking at his paintings, it's quite easy to see how his films are how they are. The man has said that his ideas come to him while indulging in a so-called transcendental meditation. Hence why all his films have this strange incoherence about them. But what I want to talk about the most is that David Lynch uses the same pullback method that we've been talking about with Satoshi Kon in Inland Empire. There are several scenes where Nikki and Devin are talking flirtatiously and suddenly the director's voice comes in to remind us that what we were watching is a film inside the film. And at other times, they're actually flirting and we expect the director to show up, but he doesn't. And yet there are other times where their names are all mixed up and Laura Dern's character is actually the character's character than Nikki herself. There is one very memorable scene where Nikki, uh, or, or maybe Susan, not sure, anyways, 
the main lead is stabbed and lays down on the street to die. And there is several minutes of homeless people surrounding her and talking about something completely irrelevant to her. And as we think that she's dead, the camera pulls back to reveal a camera. And the character stands up and the director applauds her acting whilst the character herself looks like she wasn't acting at all. It's not really too hard to see the connection between Inland Empire and Cohn's films. They're both, in a way, about art and escapism. In fact, when you compare both their filmography, you'll see that they both have similar themes that repeat. Paprika is another surrealist film by Satoshi Kon about dreams. It follows a girl named Paprika who has stolen a device that can be used to get into people's dreams in order to treat their mental anguishes. Lynch also has a film, perhaps his most famous film, Mulholland Drive, which is also about dreams. Now, spoiler alert, but the vast majority of the film is actually just a dream of the main character after she hired a hitman to kill her lover. The dream functions as a form of escapism. She dreams of herself being a conventionally happy-go-lucky talented actress and her lover's hitman being so incompetent that she manages to get out alive. She dreams that the reason why she isn't getting professional success is not because she's not good enough, but because the director actually likes her, but some other reason comes in his way and he picks someone else instead. But for Lynch, this wish fulfillment, this escapism, is also what, to an extent, films and art are. What comes to your mind when you hear the word paranoia? Delusion, perhaps? Yes, delusional, maybe. Right. The word gives an impression that a person is, in a sense, actively making himself delusional. That kind of strength is inherent in the word. Well, in order to go through life, everyone needs to have something apart from reality, such as fantasy, dream, or maybe paranoia. Otherwise, life can be surprisingly hard. Yes, the world as a person perceives, it is the world filtered through his fantasy or paranoia, I think. Paranoia Agent is one of my earlier anime watches. I really don't know why I chose to watch it when I was barely accustomed to the madness of this medium, but regardless, I did. And it's… well, I don't really have a word to describe how I feel about it. Don't get me wrong, I love it to death, but it's a rather tough pill to swallow. For one thing, Paranoia Agent is a furthering of Satoshi Kon's ideas explored in both Perfect Blue and Millennium Actress. Paranoia Agent is the story of the residents of Musashino City, who are terrorized by an enigmatic teen boy who goes around in rollerblades and strikes people with his damaged baseball bat, who they name Shonen Bat or Lil Slugger in the English version. The attacks starts with Tsukigo Sagi, a character designer whose previous design was a commercial success and is being pressured into doing the viral again. <laughs> As a stressed Sagi returns to her home, Lil Slugger strikes. After this inciting incident, rumors spread all around the region and paranoia rises. What is interesting about Lil Slugger's victims is that all of them are extremely diverse people who, at first glance, have nothing in common. But when we take a closer look, we realize that they share a singular quality that being that each one of them were attacked by the assailant and came out of the hospital a better, less stressed, mentally healthier person. For each one of them, the little slugger ended up as a savior who struck them at a time in their lives where they needed a sort of break or an intervention. Like how the kid who had been suspected of being the assailant gets attacked and gets his name cleared as a result and is rid of his social isolation and his reputation is clean again. Or like the very first victim for whom the attack resulted in her getting some space to breathe and to think about things whereas before she was constantly being pressured by her manager. To these victims, Lil Slugger became their salvation, their savior, their escape. 
And as the show progresses, the being that is Lil Slugger becomes more than human. Or to phrase it a bit more accurately, it is revealed that Lil Slugger was never really a being in flesh at all. Instead, being a concept. The final episode of Paranoia Agent is a complete mind fuck. A monstrous Lil Slugger appears and goes wild. Boatloads of Maromis, which is the character that Tsukiko Sagi had designed and had gone viral in Japan, take over the city. In fact, this character of Maromi is portrayed to be coming alive and comforting Sagi whenever she's down. Maromi, in a way, is Tsukiko Sagi's escape, her paranoia agent. And as we find out, Lil Slugger himself is also an escape, a paranoia agent. The end of Cone's Paprika also mirrors the final episode of Paranoia Agent. Of course, Paprika is a furthering of Cone's ideas in Paranoia Agent, both thematically and literally as it came out two years after the series. In Paprika, the climactic scenes echo the last episodes of Paranoia. They portray a collective dream, an overwhelming mixture of cultural artifacts and symbols that parade across the city. What's more, Cohn draws a parallel between films and dreams through one of Paprika's characters named Konakawa, a cop who wanted to be a film director but gave up trying because of a traumatic incident. Konakawa ends up overcoming his past trauma through dreams. He is able to delve deep into his subconscious and find out more about himself and begins to help himself as a result. Regardless, dreams are portrayed as a sort of collective hysteria in both Paprika and Paranoia Agent. This collective hysteria can also, when you really think about it, be used to describe art in general. Antonin Artaud was an early 20th century writer, actor, and theater director. And also, Artaud is a man responsible for the theater theory of the theater of cruelty. And it is just like it sounds. Artaud wanted to use brutality in order to, according to his theory, break the separation between the audience and the performance. I'm not talking about using meta comedy to break the fourth wall or something like that, but in a more emotional sense. When you watch a film or a play or indulge in some kind of art, you are, at the end of the day, still aware of the fact that what you are watching is something created in order to appeal to your emotions and provide you with a catharsis. Artaud wanted to break this barrier. His theory professed to physically hurt the performers in extremely cruel ways and confront the audience with grotesque imagery and sound. His vision of theater would have the stage stripped away instead of having the audience sitting in the middle while the actors performed all around them. This visceral sensory experience would sever the thin line of awareness that separated the audience from the performer, as seeing people in pain would have an explicit effect on the audience and they would feel a raw emotion via the performer's suffering. Although his theories did not materialize in any significant sense, with him having only had one chance at putting it to practice with a play named The Sensi, which did not do well commercially or critically and only ran 17 times. And yeah, Artaud was not a man who was all tidy and well up in the head. He had many problems of his own and had many unfortunate experiences with psychiatric hospitals which made his life a constant suffering. Perhaps it is from this pain that his ideas developed. Regardless, at the heart of Theatre of Cruelty is a recognition of art as something transcendental, as an ethereal experience that both the performers and the audience indulged in. Now, remember when this video was about some pullback technique? The technique of 
presenting plot A, pulling back to plot B, where A is actually just a plot inside B, so that us, the audience, our expectations are subverted. Well, when you really think about it, this technique is actually quite artodian in the sense that when this technique is used, the wall between us and the performance is actively broken. Again, not in a self-aware comedy kinda fourth wall break, but in a more subtle way. When the shot pulls back to reveal that what we were watching was in a TV or was being filmed by a camera all along, that is, it was a performance, we let go of the fact that the pulling back of the shot is a performance in itself. This destroys, even if just for a second, the separation between the audience and the film. And so, if we can describe the performance of the actor as a hysteria or a delusion, like how it is portrayed in Perfect Blue and Millennium Actress, then when the divide between the performer and the audience is broken, the hysteria is also shared. And it is this shared hysteria that is being portrayed in pretty much all the films I've talked about in this video. Perfect Blue is a look at how this shared hysteria takes a toll on the performer. Throughout the film, we hear random fans of hers gossip and speculate about her. Hell, the other Mima, which is Mima's idol persona that keeps tormenting her throughout the film, is a direct manifestation of the image of Mima that was constructed through her part in the collective hysteria, or in other words, her performances. This is why this idol Mima's presence can be felt during the scenes where Mima is half forced to do uncomfortable, overly sexualized scenes and photo shoots. It's also productive to take into account how being an idol in Japan is something that is a seat for male voyeurism and sexual objectification of women. And let's not forget the fact that the very otakus this film, Perfect Blue, is made for are themselves guilty of creating a culture of female objectification. In that sense, this idol Mima is also a paranoia agent. The object created in the minds of the voyeur now embodied. An agent of shared delusion that takes a hold of Mima, which she finally overcomes, or at least seems to have overcome. As I said, there is another valid interpretation that maintains that Mima at the end of the film isn't really the real Mima. Paranoia Agent itself is a 12 episode long examination of how these delusions begin and why. In the end, it is revealed that the serial assailant Lil Slugger was actually a made up story. Tsukiko Sagi beat herself with the metal pipe in order to get some sort of breathing space out of the pressures of work. In the process, creating a new character that people begin to be hysterical over. Although in a literal sense this time. But Cohn does not frame this with an inherently negative lens. Like in Millennium Actress and Paprika, Collective hysteria can be a positive outlet for the audience and the performer. Like how for Chiyoko, acting became a way of fulfilling her life. As she says in the end that she was never in love with the painter as much as she was in love with chasing him. Film for her became an outlet which fueled her and completed her. Cohn, along with Lynch, recognizes that this urge into escapism and this so-called collective hysteria becomes a way of interpreting the cold world of ours and also an outlet for growth and examination into the deeper collective consciousness. In that sense, I don't think that fantasy and paranoia are necessarily unhealthy. <laughs> With that said, I will end this complete mess of a video. Last video did exceptionally well and I thank you all very much for that. A special thank you to No Noise, the developer of the game Zero Underscore Abyssal Somewhere, which I talked about on that video for giving me a huge boost and saying really nice things about the video. Like, thanks a lot, dude. I really, really appreciate it. 
Follow me on Twitter and check out my other socials. And hey, why not subscribe if you haven't? No, seriously, why not? I insist.